change this off. I'm going to have to. All Put you all to sleep in ten minutes if I find the, if I do the normal one. April 26, 2016, I received a phone call that my son had been murdered in Eaton. hear a quick story about an ambitious ruler and a church seeking a new protector. Sorry. Trust me, this will tie into Gregorian chant in just a moment. It is the 8th century and the Pope has traveled all the way to Paris to ask for help. The Pope felt threatened by opposing forces and asked Pepin the Short, a leader among the Franks, to vanquish the opposition. Pepin agrees and a mutually beneficial relationship emerges where the Pope is protected by the Franks and Pepin is officially recognized as the King of the Franks. Pepin and his son Charlemagne saw to it that their people would learn the style of playing chant that was used in Rome, abandoning the Gallican style of chant that the Franks had been using. What ended up happening, though, was the two styles of chant blended to form a new style. This new style was controversial, so to give it some legitimacy, the church began associating Pope Gregory I with the creation of this new chant. Even though Gregory I didn't have much to do with its creation, this new style of chant bears his name to this day, Gregorian chant. Now, you might be tempted to think Gregorian chant is too old, too religious, or too exotic sounding to be important, but you couldn't be more wrong. Gregorian chant is the stepping stone where Western music really begins to take off. If Gregorian chant never emerged in the 8th century in Europe, Western music might have never evolved beyond simple chants, songs, and dance music. There would be no Bach, no Mozart, no Beethoven, no Soldier Boy. Pretty boy, sweat. Pretty boy, sweat. Actually, upon second thought, maybe no soldier boy would be a good thing. But seriously, Gregorian chant brought about the first widely used system of music notation in the West, and the ramifications of that ended up being huge. Let me explain. Without written music, musicians have to rely on the old tradition, which means you can only learn new music in person. With written music, not only are musical ideas recorded for future generations to study, but it also allows the music to be learned without the original composer being present. So, without this notation system, musicians wouldn't be able to share and expand on musical ideas of the past, which greatly hampers its ability to grow and evolve. Let's look at the basic characteristics of Gregorian chant so you will have some idea of what you're listening to. Number one, Gregorian chant is in Latin. 
You see, the Roman Empire was a huge reason Christianity spread across the Mediterranean in Europe. Initially, the Romans persecuted Christians, but it was the vast system of roads and trading routes that Christian missionaries used to spread the gospel. The use of Greek and Latin across the empire allowed early Christians to communicate and explains why the church would adopt Latin as its official language. Eventually, the Roman Empire made Christianity its official religion, and the bishop in Rome began to emerge as one of the most powerful. They started calling him the Pope, and Roman Catholicism began to be the most influential form of Christianity in Europe. Number two, Gregorian chant doesn't have metered rhythm. We are used to hearing certain beats get more emphasis, but in Gregorian chants, there is no sense of meter. Don't expect to really hear much of a beat in Gregorian chant. This gives chant an ethereal sound. Number three, Gregorian chant is designed to evoke a mood of worship and religious reflection. Some find them relaxing and meditative, which probably explains why an album of Gregorian chants made it on the pop charts in 1994. From a music appreciation standpoint, we should listen to them because of their historical importance, seeing them as a type of musical museum piece. Of course, you are entitled to enjoy them. Number four, Gregorian chant usually moves with stepwise motion, meaning each note of the melody moves either up or down a single note. Skipping over a note or notes called leaps in music are very rare in Gregorian chant. Also, the overall pitch range song is quite narrow. Number five, Gregorian chant features no harmony or accompaniment, so its texture is monophonic. This texture comes from two Greek words meaning one voice, an adequate description of what Gregorian chant sounds like. Even when multiple people are singing Gregorian chant, they all sing the same note at the same time. Part of the reason for this was religious symbolism, illustrating the unity of the church. Number six, there are eight sets of scales used by Gregorian chant. Well, they're not really scales in the same way major and minor scales are, but for simplicity's sake, there are eight scales called modes or church modes that Gregorian chant uses. These modes consist of eight notes dividing the octave, just like the ancient Greeks had done. This is one of the reasons the church modes were given Greek names. So Gregorian chant not only solidified the eight note scale, but it made these church modes well known throughout Europe and anywhere Catholicism spread. Church modes even show up in popular music from time to time, such as Norwegian Wood by the Beatles, which uses Mixolydian mode, and both Get Lucky by Daft Punk and Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson use Dorian mode. Two of the church modes, Ionian and Aeolian, would become the basis for the major and minor scales that are used in most Western music. There are other characteristics of Gregorian chant that I could go into, but what I've told you so far should suffice for a general introduction to chant. Let's listen to a Gregorian chant, the Dies Irae, from one of the most widely used collections of Gregorian chant, the Liber Usualis. As you listen, try to notice the aspects that are pointed out by the video. Here it is. That wasn't too hard to understand. All we needed was a bit of historical context and some general information about what to expect. 
If nothing else, we should appreciate the massive contributions that Gregorian chant made to Western music. Remember, appreciating means assigning value to something, and one cannot ignore the many valuable contributions Gregorian chant made to Western music. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to this channel so you can be notified of new music related videos like this one. Check out other videos I've made, such as What is a Fugue? or What is Tone Color? And we. Okay. So, first things first, he goes really fast there, covers a lot of stuff. So let me point out what's important. The first thing is, is that Gregorian chant is this, the A to A. And so when you go from one same name note to another, we call that an octave. Why? Because it's an A. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, that's a movement of eight notes. And what we're talking about here is the distance between two notes is called an interval. And what happens is, is that when Gregorian chant was first used and solidified within the church, and the monks started writing it down, they had to have a, a template, a palette to go by. So when you move from A to B, that's an interval of a whole step. But when you go from B to C, that's only a half step. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hands go up. Classrooms like, whoa, wait a minute. Half step, whole step. Are you serious? Oh, yeah, I'm 600 years ahead of myself. There weren't any whole steps or half steps back then. You just had the distance between A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, E to F, F to A. No, F to G, G to A. And so when you listen to Gregorian chant, you have to understand that you're not going to hear it the way that it was actually performed a thousand years ago. Because we have those black keys now. And we have scientifically assigned a difference in the actual vibrations. If an A is at 440 hertz, the octave above an A is 888 hertz, 880 hertz. And so each pitch, each tone, has a specific amount of vibrations. Otherwise, it sounds out of tune. So if I go, ah, uh, and I go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, between notes, we call it an interval. The smallest distance, so this is distance between two tones. Remember, we also used the word pitch when we were talking about tones. Now, the smallest interval is what you heard at Jaws. The smallest interval is a one-half step. Now, let's put the piano picture back up here. Easy to see. So, if you start on this pitch C, you just got ah, uh, and go up here. Ah! Uh, you go. Ah, uh, C sharp. Ah, 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 ah. That's a half step. You're moving from a white key to a black key. You're going up one half step. Ah, 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 ah. That's a whole step. 
if you start the movie, ah, uh, 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 that's not scary. But, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you can hear the difference. That smallest interval, that's what's scary. Alright, so the intervals is the distance between any two notes. Now, the reason that we have this keyboard in the 21st century and in the 10th century you only have that is that for several reasons. One, not a whole lot of instruments back then. The instruments that were made, hand stringed instruments, handmade lutes or precursors of guitars. Uh, there were no pianos. You know, the piano forte, the early clavichords, these primitive keyed instruments, they're just dreams. They're not coming in, you know, for they're few and far between. There is no standardization of music. So a C in Polkton, North Carolina, doesn't sound like a C in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Norwood. You know, so you might have a transcript of, of psalms or songs written like the, uh, the chant was, but it's going to sound completely different because this pitch, uh, somebody might call that C and be like, that's not a C, that's a B. Uh, well, sing your C. Uh, or uh, there was no standardization. Does that, you understand, does that make sense to you? It doesn't come for quite a while. Now, part of the reason that this, that I sort of race through this, is that Gregorian chant music is slow, it's boring, and it's monophonic. Monophonic, mono means single, Phonic means voice. It's one voice. So as we sang um, Happy Birthday, we'll sing Happy, if we were singing Happy Birthday to Amy, we'd sing it all the time. It's like, okay, let's sing Happy Birthday. Ah, Happy Birthday to you. And we'd all sing on that note for both of them. So when you sing Happy Birthday to somebody, you're singing a monophonic melody. You can make the argument that it's, you know, you can trace it back to Gregorian chant. Nobody's playing any chords, nobody's got a guitar, nobody's playing a strat, you know, shredding with you while you're singing. You're just singing this simple song that everyone knows. You don't even know why you're singing. You don't even know what you're singing. You just do it. Well, that's sort of what chant was. You go to church. They say, well, we're going to do this song now, we're going to do this hymn. We're going to, this even before they called them hymns. We're going to sing this now. Adoration of God. We're praising God. We're singing to God. And as I also spoke about in last class, you know, we have secular music, music of love, sacred music, music of God. And the first music that's written down in our world, and which is essentially that the, you know, the Roman Empire and the, the, what came where Catholicism then spread to the rest of the world is this idea of Latin-based, monophonic, eight-pitched uh, scale uh, melodies. And all of the music that you listen to is based, based off that foundation. Okay, any questions about that? Because it's it's important. This is the foundation of the music that you listen to. Yes? Are we good? Okay, so when you pull out your textbook and you open up, literally you open up the first cup and you see some of these songs and you see, um, you know, plain chant, in Paradisium, you see the, the, the Columbia Aspecta, uh, you, you know, these, these early Christian chant songs that it will take all of the uh, discipline you have to listen to this three minutes of music. Because it's like, 
it's like time has just hit a a, a molasses bubble. Uh, see a bunch of, you talk about kids not going to class, music majors hate this stuff. You guys are just like, okay, I know, Mr. we'll get through this, right, Mr. Spaghetti, okay, we're going we're gonna to get through it. But if you, were, if you guys were musicians, there'd be guys like taking pencils and like shoving them in their ears, just like pushing it all the way through. Do we really have to hear this? Do we really have to do this? Yeah, musicians hate this stuff more than anyone else. <laughs> I'm not really, I, I, it's just, because it's boring to us. It's a single line of melody, that's it, monophonic. Yes, that's a test question. True or false? A monophonic piece of music has 12 melodies, six trombones, five drum sets, and 30 chords. True or false? <coughs> True or false? Think false? You have a 50 chance. How many agree with their faults? Yeah. Monophonic. One melody singular. It's the basis. Remember I wrote that little dot down here in the corner of the first thing? All right. So now, and again, this is a little bit hard for me with a textbook. They start talking about major and minor already in chapter three. Well, Let's do this first. If it's eight notes between C and C, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's what you need to understand. The first note and the last note of the octave are the same name. But what happens if you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? That's called the chromatic scale. And the chromatic scale is the total notes we have. That's all you can have. So if you start at the C, then you get C sharp, then D, D sharp, E, but notice there's not a black key between E and F. So we go E, F, F sharp, up a half step, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B to C. Again, no half step there. So the chromatic scale, there are 12 notes. The chromatic scale, there are 12 notes. The test question usually is something like this. True or false? The chromatic scale has 14 notes. 30% of you are going to get that wrong. Every time. It's, it, it's, it's gotten to the point where I've thought about taking the question off the test. Because how can people get that wrong? But they do. Because you don't pay attention. You don't read the textbook, you don't pay attention. Write it down. The chromatic scale has 12 notes. 12. 12 notes. How many? 12. And that's the total <coughs> number of crayons that musicians get. You don't get 13. You don't get 14. You don't get the sharpener on the back of the box. You get 12 notes. That's it. Period. Hands go up. Mr. Smith, we're Americans, man. We can do whatever we want. We're free. We're individuals. I want to sing notes in between. Okay. Go ahead. I got no problem. Octave a box. I, I personally have no problem with it. Well, what would that sound like?
number one in Ghana right now. Man. That's a hit record. Other parts of the world have many more than 12 notes. Certain countries in Africa, you might have like 30 or 40 notes. In South America, 20 or 30 notes. In between that octave, you're like, ah! You have that. It sounds like, I don't know, however you describe that sound. But it's there. For the, for the confines of this class, for the purposes of, of this class, we're going to go with 12 notes. We're going to go with a Western tempered scale. And we'll get into the foundation of that when we get into, uh, into the Baroque and specifically to talk about uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, George, uh, Frederick Handel. You know, we'll, we'll explain that. All right. Any questions so far about what we're doing? Okay. Have we missed anything? Tempo, dynamics, intervals, different types of meter. Well, we got the chromatic scale. So here's what you need to read about in your textbook now, if you haven't already. You're going to see this. Major, minor. Major scale, minor scale. And I'm going to, I don't have my keyboard with me today. I'll, I'll bring, a, let me see if it's, you know, try something. if it's going to let me in. No. No. All right. Um, I'll start the class with that on, uh, on Wednesday. Um, so let's see what the scoreboard says. Yeah, we, we spoke in last class this idea of melody being a series of notes that move horizontally. And the notes that go up, they go down, they can stay the same, whatever, but they're repeated. You know, one note moves to another note, moves to another note. When you play harmony, and you have multiple notes being played at the same time, if you're playing piano, you might push that, push the F down, and then maybe the A, and then the D, and then the G, and you hit all those notes are depressed at the same time. If you're a guitar player, you'll strum multiple strings at the same time. That's how harmony is created in terms of music. All right. Um, I actually went fast today. I really don't have much more for you for today's class. Any questions? Let me let me give you what hap what, what's coming. I can speed things up a little bit. Because obviously music moved from one guy singing to two people singing to, in this case, three people sing. See what you think of this.
Okay, which means what? Is it mono? Is, ha, question to the class: Is that monophonic music you just heard? No. no. Who, who says no? Who says yes? Nice. Some of you didn't know. <laughs> Very smart. Yeah. This is three-part harmony now. This is called polyphony, and we'll get we'll talk more about this in the next couple classes. But this is the first. This is where music is now growing. And it becomes pretty controversial. Um, and we'll talk more about that. The one thing that, that I think you're going to be surprised about is how political music is. How much controversy can be started. We talked about when I played the Star Spangled Banner and how my one student, David, thought that the guy should go to jail. He missed all that. Great story. Um, but Gregorian chant, even in itself, is there's politics involved. And anytime politicians need a little bounce, a little juice, 